Our gut microbiome affects our immune system and overall health. In this episode, we'll visit with renowned expert Dr. David Brady to discuss parasites, viruses, and stealth infections that can compromise our gut health and trigger a variety of autoimmune diseases. To learn more, stay tuned for this episode of Immortality Now. Major funding for Immortality Now was provided through an educational grant from EnviroMed Sciences. EnviroMed Sciences offers exclusive NASA and NSF certified technologies that remove more than 99% of indoor air, water, and surface toxicants. Get peace of mind protection for your home, family, and office. To learn more, go to EnviroMedSciences.com. Hi, this is Dr. Klatz for Immortality Now, and I'm very happy to be with uh, Dr. Brady from the University of uh, Bridgeport. Thank you, Dr. Klatz. Dr. Brady's background is uh, as a naturopathic physician, a chiropractic physician. Uh, he's also uh, run a scientist. He runs a uh, research laboratory, an educator. He's one of the speakers here, very uh, highly acknowledged speaker at the American Academy of Anti-Aging Medicine. And uh, we're going to talk about immunology and uh, immunity. And I'm especially interested in the work you're doing uh, on stealth infections. So maybe you could tell us a little bit more about that. Sure. Thank you. Um, autoimmunity is a big passion of mine because we, we have a modern epidemic, basically, in autoimmunity, as you know. Uh, if you look even 100 years ago, the, the, in the incidence of inflammatory bowel disease was about one in 10,000 people. Now it's about one in 250. And that's pretty much mirrored throughout all of the autoimmune diseases, no matter which you, you really look at. They're growing incredibly. And our genes aren't changing that quickly. The environment is, and the way we're dancing with the environment is. So more and more is emerging on what's driving this epidemic. And one of the things uh, appears to be pathogens, stealth, stealth infections with various types of pathogens, including bacteria, viruses, and others. A stealth infection, just stealth just means hidden. So it's an infection that a person may harbor, but they don't have obvious signs or symptoms like they would if they had an overt cold or flu or something uh, such as that. And if they have it, they don't generally know that they have it. But one of these organisms, whether it's a bacteria or a virus, uh, for instance, may actually change the way the immune system behaves. And if they have some of the right characteristics in their structure, basically, and the proteins they express, it can look a whole lot like one of the proteins on our own tissue, whether it be your thyroid, uh, whether it be um, the uh, inflammatory or the uh, mucosa of the GI tract, or a joint structure for that matter. And if they look enough the same, the immune system can sort of get confused. It's trying to attack this virus or this bacteria that you have, but along the way, it starts locking into one of your own tissues and directing an immune response against your own thyroid or your own joints. And Dr. Brady, how would someone know that they have a stealth infection or even their physician know? Because uh, you're right, they call it uh, stealth for a very good reason. Right. It's hard to find. Well, we really have to be proactive as physicians in looking for these things. When a patient comes in either having been diagnosed with an autoimmune condition uh, and they're weighing do they want to go on a biologic or some sort of strong immunosuppressant medication and they're concerned about the side effects or they've been on them and they're still having problems, it's something to look at. Um, but beyond that, I really favor looking really more upstream and using these things in a truly preventive medicine paradigm. So if someone comes in with a family history of a lot of autoimmune disease, um, let's say we have a female come in and she's 30 years old, uh, she may not have overt signs of a thyroid condition, but we start doing her history her mother's on thyroid hormone replacement, her aunts are on thyroid hormone place replacement, her older sister is, you have to take a look at, is she next? And we can predict that, actually, with hunting down some of these triggers for autoimmunity against the thyroid. That's just one, one uh, example. A lot of people concentrate on many of the known bacterial triggers for autoimmune disease, you know, Klebsiella and Citrobacter overgrowing in the gut with rheumatoid arthritis and ankylosing spondylitis. And, Yersinia with uh, Hashimoto's, and, and there's many connections, but stealth viruses are a big player. Uh, viruses are very, very common to create stealth chronic infections, and classic examples of that are most of us are exposed to Epstein-Barr virus when we're younger, maybe you have mono or what have you, and our immune systems get it under control. They, they reduce and eliminate that acute infection that 
you know, you have symptoms and you're aware of, but you never really quite totally get rid of it. Same thing with cytomegalovirus. Why is that? Why can't we get rid of uh, uh, an early infection? Why must we suffer with it throughout life and usually uh, until late in life when our immune system fails and then mm -hmm. all of a sudden these viruses come back with a vengeance? Well, I don't know that I have the answer to that. I'm not sure anybody really does, but there are certain types of viruses that tend to be a little bit immune to the immune system entirely eradicating them. We see that with varicella, you know, with many different types of viruses, herpes, for instance. But have many of those are encapsulated viruses. So they, they sort of have a stealth mechanism built in. When they bud out of our cells, after they infect the cell, they try to get out of the cell to infect another cell to replicate. And they drag some of our own tissue, the phospholipid, a membrane of the cells, they cloak themselves in that, so they hide from the immune system. They're very, very tricky. Well, doctor, tell us the things that can be done on the part of the patient, such as uh, helping to improve their own natural biome, their own natural gut, and uh, things that you found in general are, are, are overall health uh, of the gut, and things that might have a benefit for longevity. Sure. and. Uh, I really think it starts in youth. I mean, natural childbirth, uh, being exposed to organisms that we should share our environment with and learn to coexist with early. So uh, letting kids crawl around on the floor is a good thing. Having them out in the mud and the dirt. I have two young boys myself, and sometimes I have to hose them off when they're coming in the house to make sure they're my kids, and that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. I don't stop them from doing that. They're learning to get along with their environment. They're exposed to animals and other things like that. So those are all good things that we really need to consider. Um, but. You know, sometimes we have to test these things out. So we will do testing using new molecular or DNA-based techniques. We can map the microbiota, which are the bugs that grow in the intestine. And that's our biggest exposure to bugs, is all of the critters that live in our guts. So now, with some of the new technologies, we can uh, very cost-effectively, very rapidly map the microbiota. So we can tell what kind of bugs do you have in your gut. Do you have enough of the good guys? Do you have any of the overt bad guys? Do you have opportunistic organisms? But specifically, we know very specific organisms down to the genus and species, which are at least associated with the genesis of specific autoimmune diseases. And now we're actually starting to get causal data where certain organisms, there's actually a mechanism where it can actually tra translate into the autoimmune disease itself. And what about parasites and parasitic infections of the gut? Yeah, we certainly look for those when we map the GI microbiota, and sometimes we're looking for ones that can cause problems and cause inflammatory bowel issues uh, and cause overt symptoms. But it, you can flip that the other way as well. There's been great work done by Joel Weinstock and many others looking into actually using parasites as therapy. We've eradicated many of the parasites with, with our modern hygiene, with you know water, uh, uh, treatment and, and just changing the environment that we live in and we've eradicated many of these worm-based or helminth organisms and they've actually lived with us for a very long time and one of the things they do to coexist with us is to secrete messengers that actually suppress our immune response in the gut. Mm -hmm. So over time we've calibrated to that and we've upregulated our immune response to sort of strike a happy medium. However, if you rapidly pull the parasites out that have the suppressive effect, which has only happened in the last 50 to 100 years, now you're left with the human immune response in the gut dialed up too high. And it's oh, overreactive or overresponsive. So actually introducing benign helminths into the GI microenvironment has had beneficial effects and it can actually shut down inflammatory bowel disease in many cases. Interesting, does it affect overall inflammation within the body? It certainly can if you have an inflammatory bowel condition, autoimmune driven, it's creating systemic inflammation. I mean, the worst of it is obviously in the intestinal environment, but uh, certainly if you treat that effectively, the person will be less inflammatory. Well, after all, this is immortality now, and I would be remiss if I didn't ask you, how long would you like to live? I'd like to... How long I'd, do you think you'll be able to live? I'd like to live very healthy and vibrantly and engaged in my life to 100. I would be so really happy. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's a pretty reasonable ex expectation. It is, but, but, but I, with the emphasis on not being disabled, you uh -huh. know, and, and really being able to actively participate in life. Hey, if I can go longer, I'm all for that, but that would be a great target because few people do. Even if they live to 100, those well, last uh, couple decades aren't usually pretty. That's true, um, but things are changing. They are that's changing. What we're all about is that change. Yeah, absolutely. Now, 
what are you doing in your life and uh, in your clinical practice to accomplish that? What have you found to be robust and to be, you know, I'm not talking about exercise and right. diet. I'm talking about something, something tangible. Well, you know, I'd, it's easy to, to look for the magic cure, right? The pills and the potions and the hormones and all, and they can all be important as part of the program. But I do fundamentally think that there's nothing more important you do to affect your health day in and day out than, those, than the foods you choose to put in your mouth because it's those macro and micronutrients that dance with your genes that turn on or turn, on or turn off the switches. And it depends which switches they turn on and turn off, how we express our genome. So that's very, very important. I try to eat very clean. I try to eat whole foods. I try to not eat things that my immune system doesn't get along with. So I do testing. I look at how my white blood cells react to certain food triggers and to see which, which foods my immune system seems to like and which foods it does not. I stay away from the ones that uh, it does not like. I try to keep my gut very, very healthy and not have hyperpermeability or leaky gut, not have an inflammatory bowel. Um, and a lot of that is learning the foods that you resonate with and get along with. And just, you know, having fun, keeping it simple. I mean, I'm a very busy guy. I have multiple jobs. I, you know, have multiple roles. I have young kids. It can easily get overwhelming. But I always try to frame it up in the right way and do some centering things, you know, whether it's, you know, just something simple like guided imagery or just a little bit of a, you know, a stress mitigation uh, daily practice is always good. Keep moving. Um, drink lots of water, good quality water, and it seems to work. Well, excellent. Dr. Brady, thank you. Thank you. And uh, for Immortality Now, I'm Dr. Ron Klatz at the A4M World Congress of Anti-Aging Medicine in Las Vegas, Nevada. Immortality Now is made possible through an educational grant from EnviroMed Sciences. To learn more about how to get living water in your home or to get a free home toxicity test, visit EnviroMedSciences.com. Additional support was provided by Energy Development, better health through non-invasive technology. For more information, go to EnergyDev.com.